Thank you very much, Brennan. I think those were uh, useful set of evocations, as you call them, uh, around how we can, you know, see some of your ideas around strategies for um, increasing economic density, and your argument is that that's what we've got to do with African countries. Um, okay. Alright. Okay. So what we're going to do, as we promised, is have a go around of some initial top of mind thoughts from the panel we've got. And we're mentioning that we've got a very diverse uh, and interesting uh, panel here, and all of them, I think, will have different vantage points on the issues that um, uh, that have been raised uh, by Brennan. Uh, Kate, I'd like to start with you. Uh, I must confess that I don't have a watch, and I left my phone in my handbag. So we're going to do this family style. If my shoe hits your head, it means <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. Okay, good. We've got a timekeeper who's more civilized. Uh, so, Kate, we'll start with you. We'll do a go around, um, and we'll just do it in a quick flow, and then get into more of a discussion. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. I've been briefed to talk about the informal economy. Um, it was mentioned that the African informal economies have remained large despite rapid urbanization. Now, I want to point out first, the informal economy has not just remained large. It is being informalized, it's growing, it's grown from 73% of the non-agricultural labor force around 2000 to 77% by 2017, 2018. And this is the result of a combination of jobless growth and rapid population growth. Now, while some people are making it up as they go along in the way that uh, uh, um, one of our, our earlier speakers described, um, Many of them involve systems, they informal economies involve sectors, involve traders' networks, taxi associations, light engineering clusters in Kenya's Tuakali, uh, Otiba computer cluster where people make uh, and, and repair computers. So there, there's a lot going on in the informal economy, including training and supply systems, etc. Uh, West and Southern African informal economies are very different. The Southern uh, African informal economies are very comparatively small, 30-40% of the non-agricultural labor force. In West Africa, they're much larger, 70-80-90%, and also much more complex, much more diversified, much greater and uh, more extensive systems. Now, the issues of connectivity and formalization have been raised as a way of connecting the informal economy into the wider urban system and the global economy. Now, I agree these are important, but they're important in terms of what they do, not just in terms of how fast they occur. Formalization creates perhaps new markets, uh, digital apps and digital connections with informal activities, but there's a real risk in uh, what's been going on of cosmetic formalization, which modernizes appearances, fancy markets, um, uh, digital apps, etc., without actually transforming uh, incomes, livelihoods, working conditions in ways that actually make people's lives better off, rather than just prettier. Um, there's also a disorganization of informal spatial arrangements in ways that make it more difficult for people carry on livelihoods because the spatial structures and new buildings are not appropriate to what they're trying to do. With regard to connections, we have more digital apps, global value chains, um, uh, handyman apps and taxi apps, etc., which tend to tap rather than enable the informal economy. They are inclusive of some, but they are not inclusive of the majority, and they tend to cherry-pick the lucrative niches of the informal economy while leaving behind the vast majority who don't have the capital or the skills to be able to rent stalls, buy sufficiently advanced smartphones, etc., to participate. That means that these connections leave many behind, and formalization leaves many behind. And where does this incitement majority go? And I'll stop here with the reminder that the incitement majority, and let's remember we're talking about 77% of the non-agricultural labor force across uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, that incitement majority are still there. And you will hear from them, both governments and investors. They will undermine the productivity of any urban investments if they are not integrated into the greater plan. Sorry. Thanks, Kate. Emmanuel, can you go over to you? 
All right. Um, so I'm, my, a lot of my research is really operating on a much smaller scale. Um, we've been looking at a very uh, specific neighborhood in Addis Ababa, which is Mercato, for the past five years. And over the past few years, we've expanded the research to Karya Kup and Dar es Salaam. And uh, we're particularly interested in African urban marketplaces because we believe they are the best predictors of where the city will be. I think the best way to understand where Addis Ababa will be 10 years from now is by carefully analyzing Mercato today. Um, and I think the phenomenon which is extremely fascinating about Mercato is just the notion of collective ownership. The fact that these merchants were able to form uh, cooperatives and build the malls themselves. So I think, I mean, whenever a particular regime imposes a certain uh, constraint, let's say a certain local development plan, this collective ownership system allows them to be somewhat subversive while maintaining uh, the use patterns that they've always had uh, in that neighborhood. But when you shift this over to Karyaku, uh, where the neighborhood was really part of the segregationist colonial policy to separate African Tanzanians from Indian Tanzanians and uh, the European settlers, in that case, the urban fr uh, framework was really fragmented. So you look at blocks that have that were designed to have about six to eight uh, Swahili homes, uh, single-story Swahili homes. And now each one of those blocks are being developed into 13, 14-story condos. But what is different from Mercato is the fact that in um, Karyaku, because they are owned by individual investors, they are primarily uh, profit-driven. So uh, you have a situation now where a lot of the residential uh, units are actually being transformed into storage spaces. So in a competitive real estate condition, uh, the, uh, the residential units are being absorbed by the market on the ground floor. So I think that the most important thing when dealing with these urban conditions in Africa is understanding the ownership structures and how that can help us maintain a certain level of leverage even when the structure is somewhat oppressive. Thanks, Emmanuel. So now we're going to go over to the other side of the Thank you. So I will try to talk a little bit about what are we doing in Silos, uh, about the, the, the problem we are trying to solve it, the, the urban aspect of Silos, and finally what happening now in Silos, uh, in Angers, sorry. So uh, when I founded Silos three years ago, I was just trying to solve my own problems. I had two entrepreneurial experience before Silos, and it was very difficult. I, like, I, I struggled a lot before filing. And after that, I realized how much I was and young entrepreneurs were very, very isolated from all what they need. I mean, uh, clients, uh, or, uh, partners, mentors, and, and certainly other entrepreneurs. So I wanted to create space, a space where entrepreneurs can, can get out from, from all other problems and get out from isolation. So this was the beginning. Today, we are working on other problems who are not really uh, related to, to startups and entrepreneurs. For example, and we discovered these problems during the journey. For example, we, are, we, we found out that recruitment was a very, very uh, big issue for, uh, for young businesses and, uh, and for co corporate as well. So we, we created services about that. On the other side, we discovered that uh, technology uh, wasn't used as widely as it should be in in the country. For example, I don't know for other cities, but uh, but in Algeria, uh, for the most people, internet is just social media and uh, and Craigslist uh, websites. So we're trying to, to help people, to train people to, to to explore more things on technology and uh, to create something about it, create value about uh, technology. Uh, so we are trying to learn from audios on a daily basis to, to, to create something and to, to, to have uh, an, uh, an optimal uh, impact. I think I need to talk a little bit about open because I'm in the open, yeah, I will be very quick. So 
the urban aspect of Silabs, the first one was location. We need to be located in, uh, in somewhere when we can get people. So we are very sometimes we are located in downtown and uh, nearby because we because we, we can have like bus station and metro station and we can be accessible. And the other part of being uh, being downtown is I think it's very important is occlusion because we could have like space in uh, in very fancy uh, neighborhood where we can meet with the embassies and uh, and big corporates. But I think it could be. Uh, have been away from our purpose, which is uh, gather on our components. I will get quick think about what happening now in Algiers. There is a lot of good things in happening. Uh, for example, the way of Algiers, the government of Algiers create a big project called Algiers Smart City. And uh, I think I need just a little. <laughs> and they are actually, they are trying to, to implement local local innovation on the management of, uh, for, of the, the urban uh, of Algiers. And I think it's very, very good because we can prove by fact how small innovative businesses can, can affect the daily life of the uh, city. Thank you. I feel guilty for having you all sprint along, but thank you for doing this. We'll come back into the discussion. Ricardo, are you going to talk to us about money? Yes. Um, different kinds of money. Um, I learned when you attend these conferences, there's two important things outside of the end operations. One, the show of the city. Secondly, the cocktail on the evening before. So I missed the, the city tour, but I managed to sneak into the uh, cocktail and keep my hit ratio 100%. And in that um, half hour, hour that I was there, I managed to actually meet some member. And uh, there was a question I asked him about the genesis of ICE. Addison itself, how it's informed, this rich history of this country. And um, what I learned is that in 1886, there was a, um, a merger of different uh, kingdoms into the country, which was obviously complemented by my Wikipedia research when I got to my room. Um, <laughs> there, um, and and I, I, I want to dive deeper into the aspect of funding cities, and the genesis of those cities kind of informs where we are from a funding perspective. And I'll give about three or four examples. If you look at a um, city like uh, San Francisco that was essentially built upon the gold rush, nothing deliberate, the first one up gets uh, the, the prize, and after that there was a form of structure that came out of the case. Uh, if you look at Johannesburg, quite similar. Um, then if you come to cities like uh, Otago in Nigeria, where there was a preliminary structure of administration, and then after that, post-1912 into the 50s, was a discovery of oil. So there's a blend between um, the aspect of administration, depending who the powers are, and then a resource. So there's a confluence of resource on one side, and uh, politics on the other. Um, I'm from Kampala, which um, essentially was the colonial capital that maintained it. And as far as I know, we have not struck gold, we have not found oil. But what you have is a large catchment area of consumers. Uh, I think it's maybe about two and a half million people right now. And uh, from the perspective of capital that's being invested in our country or our city for that matter, there is a strong thrust towards the, pro the consumption side of capital. And uh, again, you talked earlier about the constraints that come with uh, timelines and expectations to turn around your capital very quickly. It is not the right form of capital for long-term planning for the city. So we need to move away from consumption, suddenly, to the aspect of production, which goes back into your aspects of pension reform, uh, your tertiary institutions, your education system, uh, vocational training. Uh, etc. etc. So the dimension around capital needs to balance the attractiveness of FDI but certainly tap into local capital that can essentially move beyond the horizon of uh, private equity that really stops at about around seven or eight. Uh, so um, I just want to touch quickly on the point you made Kate about uh, the informal fund. Uh, it is the, uh, if you talk about the economic part, that's 70% in Africa. But I want to distinguish between the uh, just two more seconds. 
the aspects of the informal artisan being able to produce uh, as opposed to being able to consume. So the opportunistic capital that's looking at the informal cultural economy knows that they'll make forms, they'll watch football, they'll probably use a Uber ride, but the aspect of production itself is something that we really still need to work on. Thank you. Talking about capital, and I think you're going to talk about some key players. <laughs> yeah, so my area of expertise is what China is doing in Africa. And at a conference like this, your mind might go immediately to the infrastructure side. But actually, I'm going to start on the investment side because it has just as much, if not more, of an impact on these questions, not just of urbanization, productivity, uh, production, uh, employment. Uh, skills, the future of youth, and so on, than even infrastructure does, in my opinion. So, um, over the last few years at McKinsey, we've carried out a very large scale research project where we've actually gone out and visited more than a thousand Chinese firms already operating in Africa. And what we found from that were several surprising things. So, first of all, it is Chinese investment is the fastest growing and already one of the largest sources of investment, private investment, into Africa. But beyond the size, what is important is also the composition of this investment. What sectors is it going into? And unlike other sources of FDI, a third of the Chinese firms operating in Africa today are in manufacturing. That is very, very unique. Uh, as the other speakers have pointed out throughout, Getting that manufacturing share up in cities is critically important for the future of work in Africa, as well as the future of how these cities evolve, economically and socially. So the other thing that's really surprising about what Chinese investment in Africa is doing is the impact on market modernization. So this question of innovation. We were very surprised to find that half of all of the Chinese firms operating in Africa have actually introduced a new product or service into their African market, and a third of them have introduced a new technology. Right? And this is being done in business models that are already selling. Right? So this is not donor-based, this is not you know, socially motivated capital, this is purely private capital finding ways to bring innovation in a sustainable way into their markets. Now very quickly, let me switch to the infrastructure side because obviously China, Chinese money, Chinese firms are already the largest providers of financing, but also the largest builders of large-scale infrastructure in Africa today. But what I want to focus us on is not these large bridges, roads, you know, these sorts of projects that are on the news all the time because we all know about those. I want to focus our attention on special economic zones because I think that is the urban form that is most critical and most complicated and best illustrates these complexities of this dynamic between investment infrastructure and the future of urbanization in Africa. What's been alluded to is that in China, of course, special economic zones are the urban form that has most encouraged the development of a middle class, people's movement out of poverty, encouraging people to work in manufacturing. And so not surprisingly, Chinese efforts in Africa have also repeatedly tried to develop and help African firms develop, but also have Chinese private capital develop special economic zones. What I'll just say in the last minute is that it is extremely mixed. There has been more failures than successes. And it has not, so far at least, really encouraged the sort of uh, concentrated, agglomerated economic activity that rises to global productivity levels. Now, Hawassa here in Ethiopia may be the emergence of an exception to that, um, but it's, it's fascinating that you know, the Chinese themselves have not quite figured out how to do in Africa, at least yet, what it has done so well in China. Back to Uganda, uh, and there, what's along the entrepreneurial perspective? I think might be of innovation. Yeah, so um, it's it's actually really interesting listening to Ricardo talking about capital and uh, investment. Um, you remind me so much of uh, the men that built America. I think some of us have actually watched a series about that. 
most of America, let's be honest, was built on efforts of entrepreneurs. Uh, people like Carnegie, people like Ford, yeah? I'm from Kampala, and I run an enterprise. We recycle plastic, we collect plastic waste, and we make affordable uh, eyewear, just like what I'm wearing, and we also make affordable building materials, uh, like uh, interlocking blocks, with a long-term plan of uh, providing low-cost housing. So what am I trying to, to say here is that all the things that you're mentioning are actually intertwined. Raising capital, working with stakeholders in city council and building cities, everything is intertwined together with startups, entrepreneurship, and, and uh, business, right? So um, a little bit of my experience, um, most, if not all, of the capitals are raised from my, from my business. I have raised from outside of Uganda. So people from the US, people from Australia investing in my business. And when I walk to uh, Uganda, they don't understand what I'm doing, which is actually really surprising. If we're going to build our country, if we're going to build Africa, we need to see the opportunities. That's the first thing. Second thing is I see, I mean, there's been legacy systems being built uh, by by city councils and all different stakeholders, yeah? They're, they're giving a lot of opportunity to legacy businesses, people that have proved their concepts, right? However, they're not listening to the new way of doing things, and I think innovation is, uh, we're driving the face of innovation. Young people are driving the face of innovation. We're not looking for uh, grants or, um, a, a, you know, just a, a competition win, you know? create a competition and somebody wins a prize, we want revenue. We want to be given an opportunity to make revenue. So when uh, cities are building, we want to be part of that. And I think that's exactly what I, I want to, to reflect the most about today in this presentation. Thank you. I want to Flow up a little bit um, on what Irene uh, said and actually many other contributions. We were told this morning that Africa's, Africa's African cities have closed doors to international business. I don't think so. Uh, actually, doors are really wide, wide open. And, um, and now, uh, after a process which is obviously ongoing of uh, intense uh, FDI or investment, we also really look at these uh, results that have emerged in the other form and the other structure um, and critically evaluate if actually these um, paradigms that are not reflected and density mobilization, FDI orientation and so forth are still valuable in producing good results. And it's a privilege of the researchers, uh, of which I am one, uh, to poke around in, in those kind of uh, situations. And so we have actually looked at um, the spatial imprint that um, has been left by such special economic zones, industrial parks. Research took us from the margins of the EU in Bulgaria, Turkey, actually following the thing straight into Addis, where a company had just recently relocated to from, from Turkey, where wages uh, uh, were rising and, uh, and uh, economic gains are shrinking. So Addis became the new um, destination, uh, in fact, for a lot of Tesla uh, companies around the world. It's, and it's very, very impressive how the Turkish government uh, is responding to this with a structured century plan. Um, uh, uh, effort uh, for uh, installing in, in the country um, a network of, um, uh, of infrastructures for circulation of those durable goods. Um, but this very company that we follow from Turkey to ICE, um, in fact, now is moving on to Burkina Faso because um, uh, the wages are here rising and, uh, um, and uh, you know, they're looking for another uh, uh, sort of opportunity to make uh, most profit. So I'm uh, worried, definitely worried about this uh, sort of development, uh, this sort of impatient capital that Edgar uh, uh, mentioned this morning, the sort of predatory uh, behavior of these um, uh, uh, these businesses and the kind of traces they leave in the urban fabric, um, with the danger, I'm not saying all uh, do, but the danger of leaving that these global factories leave a sort of fragile, unsafe urbanism, which is in fact highly subsidized, and um, it is felt at the expense of the rest of the city. Um, uh, it, it adds to, it does not improve uh, the structural fragmentation of the African cities. And it's not anchored, um, it doesn't anchor the global value chains and, and production networks within the distinct places 
and existing structural systems of, of the city. So I would argue for uh, two points um, for um, much more local pushing for more, more local resource-based uh, approaches, um, uh, which actually provide these kind of linkages, including linkages to um, the older constructed cities or urban informalities um, that uh, Emmanuel has been uh, researching to. And we're looking at these enclaves. They are far apart from the city, mostly outside. They take the shape of uh, satellite cities. And they are creating sort of densities, which uh, we should worry about uh, because they are densities um, that are uh, densities for the few, um, uh, mostly for the rich. Uh, they may create uh, traps. So instead of density, I would actually, uh, in centralities, I would propose a counter paradigm of polycentricity. Um, and um, this is exactly actually where European cities are moving towards. We are thinking of decentralizing our cities. Uh, we are looking for uh, qualities at the periphery, dispersal of functions, um, new forms of live, by, live work arrangements across the city, and no longer in uh, centralities, whatever uh, form or shape they take. Um, so uh, I'm with Emmanuel that we should be um, much more looking at other kind of um, visions of uh, working with uh, the city that includes older constructed um, um, uh, neighborhoods um, and think about instead of sort of building uh, visions that are at odds, uh, present us with an innovation model that's really at odds with the city that we have, uh, built on the sort of um, in, in, on, on the vibrancy uh, of, um, of the city that there is. So thank you all for uh, your generosity in complying with the rapid fire round. And I think what we'd like to do now, and I don't even know how much time we've got for a quick round table conversation, about 10 minutes for it. Um, and we really like to see that there's a lot of people to contribute. A number of people in the table are raising you want some potential the conversations uh, that we face, right? So we're talking about how in case people have to actually back that over one side because we can't mobilize it internally. But we're also acknowledging that we have to mobilize what is internal and we're recognizing that history matters in terms of where places are, the solutions they live in, and the zero of humanity is going to be broad, and then we've got to work with what we have to some extent. Um, what we're also reminded by, around a lot of course, is that many of us are still going to be sort of factor driven economies, and as much as we're talking innovation and that that's the future, and future economies are innovation driven, our ecosystems perhaps are not strong enough and well aligned enough. So when we talk about where actors are versus where they need to be, when we talk about our ability to mobilize resources to where we need them, when we understand our ability to leverage external actors uh, in ways that are beneficial, I assume not only to introduce innovation but also enable endogenous innovation, you know, all of these things begin to matter. So maybe one of my lead questions that I'm opening up this up to everybody, you know, if I were if I were a mayor <laughs> um, <laughs> What would you suggest to me that if we're trying to drive an innovation in the economy in this city or in the cities you're speaking on, what kind of policy directions could I take that begin to acknowledge you know, space, capital, people, all of the things we're talking about, that would actually enable, enable what is happening as opposed to giving up what isn't? Um, uh, and I'm raising this specifically in a long conversation with Bella yesterday about how often the instincts are to develop new infrastructure, to do new things in places out there rather than to maybe concentrate, uh, including within the informal spaces and the efforts that you can that people are already making. So not just say young people have hackathons, what could you do that would really enable people to do what they're trying to do? So could you give me some advice? What are specific things we could be doing similar to a different thing that would lead to any of the presentation This is probably about an ad it's just a... <laughs> I think uh, part of the issue is uh, that we're suffering from um, a lack of imagination when it comes to representing African cities. So I feel like we always end up resorting to the same pie charts when the most interesting parts of these cities are their strategic invisibility. Basically, there are ways in which people choose to not make their strategies visible, uh, especially for outside audiences, in order to maintain leverage. So I think uh, we need to come up with more uh, robust and complex ways of representing these cities, uh, whether it's the language or the drawings or the pie charts. 
we need to find other ways of building value systems from within because the tendency is always to superimpose value systems that are, that are imported from elsewhere. Um, and, I, and I understand this doesn't necessarily apply to you know, the entrepreneurial questions, but I do think when we're discussing the right to the city and when we're discussing issues of porosity and inclusivity, then we need to represent these cities with, uh, I don't know, with more complexity. <laughs> Right. And diversity of models, I assume, I was struck by your figures, Brennan, on the issue of ownership uh, versus owner. You know, I was not surprised. So Nairobi has 90% private ownership. That's exactly why everybody's a tenant. Um, and so and you talked about more collective ownership models, and maybe those are possibilities, maybe not in Nairobi, but just this idea that there are contradictions between these things. But Brennan, you wanted to come in here. Yeah, I, I just have a comment. I mean, nobody's talked about education. School. Training, right? And where Africa and African cities are in that, because I mean, the raw data is, is not pretty. And um, the question is what's happening on the ground in terms of education and is it appropriate? Is it uh, the programs there for kids to? I mean, if I look at attendance rates in Africa, they're great. A lot of 13 year olds in school, but they've only completed grade two. That's not a very good song. I'm just saying human capital is out there talk about this. You mentioned this. I see you want to come in? Yeah. Just um, the, the matter of education is key. I think when we had reforms in our education system, it was very much a quantitative uh, metric that was driving us. So how many kids are in school, um, tick the boxes, and then have a cocktail after. <laughs> Um, uh, recently, in the context of a more globalized uh, economy where we're looking to substitute imports, there's got to be uh, there's a reversal there's a reversal to the template where technical skills combined with um, contemporary uh, approaches towards education is, is being driven. Um, I think there's a blend between the private sector and the public sector. I'm currently working with um, a couple of investors who are developing an SDI in McKay University, the Science Tech and Innovation Hub, that is going to try and change the script somewhat on these teenage kids who we need to drive the next year of innovation like, like Brenda is doing. So it's, it's a process. I think it starts there, but again, the, the capital that is typically available does not have a, a, a generation to wait. So we have to apply our minds on how better to, to, to raise your capital. Uh, yeah, it's very important what you mentioned about education and specifically uh, education that's uh, aimed at improving particularly uh, manufacturing and uh, technical skills for people to be able to work in the factories that are actually coming up. Uh, but secondly, I think we also need to be careful not to just copy paste solutions. And I think that's something that needs to be uh, I know, I know there are some things that work in different countries, maybe cable cars in Colombia or wherever, but they wouldn't be able to work in Kampala. We need to take care of certain intrinsic uh, challenges and appreciate the differences and the cultural differences that actually make us who we are, and then that's how we can build our cities comfortably. Uh, so I think we really need to pay attention to that. Yeah, I would actually broaden the conversation from education to skills. And those two things in, in developing country contexts can actually be quite different. So if you look at the, the history of how countries that have industrialized and developed sustainably have done it, they have not done so in the first phase by, by reforming education systems. They have done so by creating mass employment where workers can plug in even though they are not very educated and then they can rise to, they can become part of globally, global levels of productivity, businesses, and then their kids get formally educated at the high school or college level, right? And so I think it just underscores the need that African cities have to actually attract the sort of investment in manufacturing and industry that actually allows workers who today, by and large, are not primarily high school or college educated, at least not you know, in the real sense, even if they have the diploma, uh, to plug into productive systems 
And then that starts the gear wheel turning towards skills development and also towards their, the future generations of being more formally educated. And I, I think that leads me to this notion that when we talk about innovation, I think there's often a conflation with invention and with technology. And I would emphasize innovation with a small I, which is how do you become more productive? How do you do things faster? How do you get to that global le level of competitiveness and productivity? Right? It's about methods. It's about these unsexy kinds of innovation rather than about inventing stuff or digitizing stuff. So I was, I was curious what your thoughts were on um, Irene's reflections on um, trying to make the, the um, um, economic zones as a modality of work. So of course in your research, you reflected on the complexity of these informal value chains, the clustering that does happen, specialization and so on. And I was curious whether you thought that there's a conversation to be had about not, if you will, disrupting those systems that you study and, and document, and the possibility of converting that into formats that look something like the economic zone model or not, and whether that echoes what Philip was talking about, about, about a more polycentric set of nodes we can hear before, where this kind of economic generous, uh, generation can happen. So I was just curious from your research point of view of the data whether there's a compatibility or whether the model that the Chinese have kind of really um, um, in some ways perfected in the Chinese context, whether that can be appropriated in some way in the African context and maybe answer some of the questions that the Chinese investors have been arguing up against in Africa. Uh, thank you. I, I think this question actually is about has some potential, but it's also problematic for a number of reasons. One, it is a node of labor formalization. And a lot of people who are coming out of um, school systems in African cities, they're not looking to be low value labor in a special economic zone. They're actually looking for something a bit more meaningful. And I think there, the class level of work provision, what constitutes meaningful employment for different classes of people is absolutely critical. Um, young graduates don't want to be workers, lowly workers in manufacturing activity or informal workers at the bottom of a value chain. They actually want to move into higher tech or managerial positions. The sorts of things that uh, a few of our speakers have promoted. Um, and I think that these kind of young graduate startups are great for creating higher level jobs or supporting these kinds of groups rather than creating space for the Ubers and the international uh, types of, of fancy startups to come in. There are other people, highly trained as well, highly skilled, who are informal occupational groups. The taxi drivers who have road knowledge and mechanical knowledge, the computer cluster workers who can build and repair a computer, shoemakers, etc., who have all kinds of skills and who actually want to be doing those things. Um, who can be supported through systems. There are apprenticeship systems highly developed in West Africa. Ghana used to have a brilliant uh, Swami magazine uh, system where they've supported upgrading, technical upgrading within informal light engineering systems. Um, all of these things have been run down over the last several years. Um, the Juakali system in Kenya can use significant assistance in investment and technical upgrading rather than just being displaced by some kind of new whiz digital things and putting these people at the bottom of a, a, a value chain. So I think what planners need to, to focus on more is engaging with the imperatives of creating meaningful work and what that means. And that means not just flashy startups who are very useful for creating more high value jobs and deserve support but they're not going to employ the bulk of the informal labor force. And again, we're talking about roughly 77% of the non-agricultural labor force. Second of all, the Chinese involvement, which I think has been highly useful and, and productive, but if Chinese involvement means that Chinese firms are moving into small-scale manufacturing and moving into retail trade, they're displacing 
critical area of job creation in Africa, which is not going to end well. I think China has a huge role to play in job creation, technical upgrading, infrastructure, etc. But it's really important, as Tandika Mukandawire has said over and over again, China has a plan for Africa. It is absolutely vital that Africa have a clear plan for China. How they want them to make it. So we're going to soon open to the floor, but I want Irene maybe to come back in on this and but also just throw in the fact that, of course, in the last month or so, China's adopted a new framework for urbanization in China, that I think there's a recognition that the Chinese urban model is unsustainable uh, from an economic and from an environmental perspective. And I'm always curious why what seems to be a very sophisticated discussion about urbanity within the Chinese context gets displaced when Chinese investors arrive in Africa to invest in urban form. And what's the scope to have a joint discussion as the Chinese uh, sort of machine uh, uh, tries to grapple with these questions to, to, to have those discussions in the African context as well because, of course, the interdependence and the connection is only going to strengthen uh, over the next couple of decades. So after Irene's response, we're going to open to the floor. So as you can imagine, this is a very well-informed and opinionated audience, so there's going to be many takers. Um, so if you can have your questions sharp and prepared, um, we will then take a round of questions from the floor. Irene? So what I want to bring into this discussion is the, the understanding of how it is that you build manufacturing centers in general, right? And this is outside of the experience of just Africa, just outside of the experience of just China. If you look globally at where manufacturing has moved over the last two centuries, it's always been through a combination of having labor, a labor pool that's relatively cheap locally, but then the seed of a foreign investment that has the technical and practical know-how of knowing how to run factories at the productivity frontier globally. Now the issue with manufacturing in Africa today is that it's subscale and it's far from, in general, far from that productivity frontier globally. So in serving local markets, it's not generally competitive for export. Right? And so what it needs is both of those things. Now the demographic explosion here means that there is that labor pool, but it needs the seed of investment with that know-how. In China itself, China did not have this. It also had that seed two generations ago from Hong Kong, from Taiwan, from Korea, from Japan. Right? And now Chinese investors are going out, and one of the places it's landing is in Africa, but it's not the only place. They're also going to Southeast Asia, they're also going to Bangladesh, uh, all over the place, right? And so one of the questions for Africa is, can Africa receive, win as large of that share of that technical know-how, that innovation with a small, small eye, right, that knows how to run factories at that global frontier to employ these masses of people from the demographic explosion? Right? And what we know from the, the factories already operating here is that there is no issue of job creation locally. 95% of the workers in Chinese factories today in Africa are local. Right? There is no other way to run a globally competitive manufacturing business. There just isn't. Right? And so, the, again, I pose the question for Africa as how do you attract, how do you create the right urban forms, how do you have the right policies, how do you have the the right financing to attract that next wave of manufacturing highly productive industrial investment. I'm so tempted to respond because you know when you made the comment about Tandio <laughs> Kandoire and Africa having a plan for China, and as I'm listening to you, Irene, I can't help but think that maybe first we need a plan for ourselves. Um, because you're talking about not being geared up for manufacturing for an international market. I'm not sure we produce enough for our domestic markets. And I think there's something to be said for being able to address the problems you have before worrying about other ones. But I think let's open up to the room. Um, and I think the way we'll do this is take a set of five questions. I hope you're not the one running around the mic. <laughs> 
oh, to stand up and signal. So we'll try and take a set of questions. So the first five hands that pop up, there's one over here, Edgar. I see two at the back there. Oh, okay, should we do that? And we'll try and do a few rounds. So please, short, sharp questions, uh, either general or directed to somebody specifically, and we'll try and do then short, sharp answers or responses. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amir Alwando. I'm from Zambia and Company for Red City Development. Um, I think mine is more a sentiment as, well, as much as it's, 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 a, it's something that they will answer. And that is, when we look at it in terms of Africa, nobody has really talked about how the government wants to be the core at the center of activities which ideally have a significant mind. So, for example, if we look at it in terms of how we position cities, the government wants to be the ones do, running the power, running the waste management, running the water. But then ideally, when we look at it, they're all poorly run. Such that if the government remains to be a regulator and enforce the city, that the citizens uptake these services and the providers providing these services, we would see a great inclusive growth. For example, one practical example. Okay, okay, so that was a nice test run. So you make your point. No examples. <laughs> Next. You got it. There's a high test. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Delami Maru, and I'm with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, leading the work on urbanization. My question is: You've uh, thank you very much to the panelists and speakers. Excellent round of interventions. You've all spoken about productivity, competitiveness, job-rich urbanization, and how to transform urban economies for improved economic growth, but also for improved social indicators. My question is, how do you see this playing out in a context where there are some serious disconnects between economic and spatial planning at the national level? You talked about Africa having a plan for itself. Many African countries today have plans for themselves. They have national They, they do have national uh, development plans. We're seeing a serious resurgence of national development plans, and that's where the priorities are decided. That is where the questions around job-rich growth, economic uh, transformation, productivity, etc., are addressed. Urban is not there. So the way that we're thinking about urban right at the top in our national visions and strategies is disconnected to how we're thinking about economic priorities. So. I'd like, I'd like to hear your thoughts around that. Yeah. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Adi Posi I'm a student of architecture and I'm a researcher at uh, Lagos Urban Network. Um, my question is about scale. Um, and based on the first presentation, the framing presentation, uh, there were two pie charts showing 70 to 80 percent of uh, African rural economic activity has been agriculture and 20 to 30 in the urban vein agriculture. So, and it's quite specific. Uh, if urbanization is taking place in, in, in the urban environment and there is this population growth, I'm not sure the consequential effect on the rural environment, but what capacity of the uh, rural areas, to, what capacity does the rural areas have to produce for the increasing population in urban areas? So in essence, what I'm asking is who fits the city of the future? Great, thank you. So we're gonna go in the interest of equity to someone on that side. Uh, with no hands. Okay, so this this cohort here, please. Jürgen Lartz, I'm leading a small company in uh, Berlin. Um, I have a question uh, regarding urbanization in itself and the role of digitization. I think we, we look at urbanization as something as a force of nature that comes over us. The question is whether we can and should think digitization in the context with urbanization in a way that we can balance between the centers and the rural areas. From the perspective of the world. Yeah, thanks. One, uh, sir, your hat is stunning. You have to speak. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Masip Nohara. Uh, I'm a former member of parliament and freelance management consultant. 
I represent nobody. Nobody invited me. I invited myself to this place because I have a story to get regarding this for work. I was wondering if uh, maybe I should, I should wait for the microphone. Oh, sorry. I was wondering if I can tell the story now or wait until tomorrow on the critics of urban finance. So we can't do stories now? We just said about the municipal bonds. Excuse me? I want to talk about municipal bonds in Turkey. Okay, so, so tomorrow we've got a session dedicated specifically to the research on Ethiopia. So I think that would be the perfect slot for you. Thank you, sir. And welcome. So we're going to have to close the... Okay, well, there's one very disappointing... And we haven't given this cohort a chance. My, I'm Jackie Klopp from Columbia University. I have a question about land. I was shocked to see the statistic of 90% of Nairobi's land in private hands. I don't know how you would find that number given the high levels of irregularity and frankly elite informality in the way that land is allocated in Nairobi. And from an urban planning perspective, if 10% of your land is in private hands, then your city is unplannable and ungovernable because you need far more than that for space, for the industrialization, for affordable housing, for utilities, for streets. So I guess that means Vernon is first on the block to respond. Thank you. Well, I, uh, let me respond to two things. One about it is services in the rural area and the large uh, fraction, uh, seemingly large fraction of people living in uh, towns really that are uh, in agriculture. And one of the concerns is, first of all, we think of the rural sector in other countries, this, the non-agricultural part is really serving the rural sector. And instead, there's really nothing there in the rural sector. In terms of the development of the rural sector, there are all the issues of transport and getting goods to market that are, and getting better technologies and utilizing technologies better, using fertilizers, having irrigation, it's a whole mess of problems. This is an urban conference, so we really didn't get into that, but it is a, it is a huge issue. On uh, Nairobi, I was trying to make the point, yeah, that the 90% of land includes, it doesn't include roads and stuff like that, or public uh, places. This is uh, for businesses, residents, commercial activity. Um, the, the slums house uh, about 30% of the population. Most of that is not private land, but some of it is. Um, the, the disconnect is, and, and I did, maybe I didn't emphasize it enough, is that whatever you want to call it, this 90% figure was achieved in a very corrupt fashion that left people without ownership. Right? And that is a big issue for the quality of wealth looking, looking to the future. I think maybe um, a place to touch on this as well is this comment about the spatial the disconnect between economic plans and or economic realities and spatial plans. I don't know if anybody in the panel would like to speak to this. I, I imagine you do. I'm not going to speak to it, just to say to the panelists from an airtime point of view, this is probably your last comment on the panel before we have to close for lunch. So you may want to respond to us whatever questions you wish to, uh, but also make your final statement uh, in this round. So no pressure. <laughs> okay, so in that case, let me do it differently. <laughs> I think there was a specific question around uh, urbanization and digitization. I thought, Abdullah, maybe you'd like to comment on this one. And so maybe we can start with you on the last round. So I think the question came from the back here around, do we see any possibility in terms of the trends around digitization <laughs> as well as some of the sectors that you might be engaging with for how the kind of productivity you have in the urban community begins to benefit the rural as well? Yeah, thank you. Actually, it's, it's related on uh, some point to what, which uh, Brinda talked about it. Uh, when we try to talk about digi digitalization and technology, we, we, we used to, to have some example from, uh, from Europe or from America. We, we, we tried to, to create Silicon Valley in, uh, in Algiers or in, in, uh, in Kampala. And uh, I think it's, uh, it, it's a wrong way. Because actually it's very the, the, local, uh, the local need is very different from uh, what's happening in, uh, in Europe or in America. And, uh, and I think the second point is 
even in Africa, there is big difference between between Algiers, Dar es Salaam, and uh, Johannesburg. We are working a lot of uh, with a lot of uh, other uh, te technology hubs in uh, in Africa. We are, we are part of Afri Labs, and uh, believe me, it's it's very different what they are doing, what they need, and uh, what we are doing. So. Of course, we need to learn from others. We need to learn from Europe, from America, from other uh, other uh, continent. But there is big work to do in uh, to adapt what they are doing, what uh, what they what they have as input, what they have as result, to to to, to have an impact uh, on uh, on our cities. So we need to to adapt. We need to to be uh, to have some vision, to have some. Uh, some ideas from other cities and other countries, but but the work, the, the adaptation work is uh, is very important. So even for for other uh, other projects, I need to, to more collaboration between between international uh, entities, between corporate, between uh, between innovation communities to to reach uh, to reach what we are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Bikara. I can just come to you because you're next, and to carry on on this point. There's this question about the alignment between economic strategies and spatial strategies. So, for example, what Kampala might be doing, what capital is doing, and what entrepreneurs are really trying to do. Uh, do you want to use that as a lead into your resistance? I was a little bit, if you don't mind, interested in the gentleman from Zambia. Um, I, I think ultimately, in any economy, you go to government is the enabler. So, there's infrastructure that needs to put in place, your roads your water, that's, uh, before privatization of electricity. Um, there's an aspect of decentralization around electricity with mini grids, etc. Uh, but it depends on where you are. I mean, we, uh, we have a project in uh, northern Uganda for a, a industrial park, over 400 acres. But lo and behold, uh, the railway that we need to evacuate products stops 125 k's away from, from, from the site. So we're having to dig deeper. Um, to extract capital to, to fund that rehabilitation. On the other side, you have, um, I, I think everyone must have followed the story about Amazon looking for a second city <laughs> for their HQ. And it's been, a, it's been a game show type drama where all these 240 type towns have been going and presenting their credentials to, to uh, the court of Jeffries. Uh, we don't have that answer. Um, ultimately, um, it's going to take a little, little bit longer up until the time Wazi Vision becomes a giant like Amazon, so that you can sort of pontificate and choose where you want to be okay. But just to have, uh, in summary, just two uh, closing remarks in terms of what Ethiopia is doing. Uh, I think the industrialization, the opening up, the merge between government, uh, the confidence of government and private sector initiatives is something that. We're learning uh, this industrialization here that is employing locals, and ultimately, it's, it's time for the rest of Africa to wake up and smell the coffee. Uh, and, uh, so, to speak, uh, we should know that it's a marathon uh, course. Thank you. Actually, let me jump to Brenda and we can close out with Uganda altogether. Do you want to build upon this? You also mentioned specifically the role of the municipality in some of your dealings, the local council, so maybe you also want to comment. Yeah, correct. Um, again, it takes me back to the gentleman from Zambia. He mentioned a really, really important point, and uh, he said, look, uh, let the government, let the, let the authorities do what they need to do, and then they enable the private people to do what they need to do. I mean, speaking from, for instance, in, in, in Uganda, uh, KCCA has uh, created a recycling plant. A plastic recycling plant. I'm still yet to understand what they want to do with that plastic, if they're willing to give it to me. But the truth is, we are already doing that as well. I don't know if they're aware that they're private people like us doing this, but it would be nice to create synergies. I mean, I do three, two to three tons of plastic a week that I, I recycle and I, I, and, I, and I manufacture cool stuff out of. So if they could work together with people like us, I think overall would be working towards something bigger and, and, and just uh, pulling at those synergies and, and, and doing something greater together. And, and this is with the alignment of strategies then, so I think this is Absolutely. a good point. You look like you're pitching to say something, so let's get you in. Okay. Um, about the, the right spatial planning response, I, I have a feeling that at the moment the situation is, or the approaches are very polarized. Either, and I include myself in this, um, uh, people argue for bottom-up uh, uh, approaches, for acupuncture, for, for micro-strategies. Uh, clearly that it's not 
uh, also not enough. Um, but there's a certain tendency, I think, of, um, of the sort of falling in love with the grand gesture and um, to, to solve everything. And, and that, um, that often takes the shape of um, actually a tabula rasa kind of reimagination of the city altogether because the existing city is just too messy, it's beyond all. And uh, so I would argue somehow maybe for a kind of meso scale, um, escaping into the middle ground, um, as it were, of this dilemma, uh, where you know, we need to sort of deal with the reality of a very polarized, uh, fractured city and somehow um, reconnect these kind of bits. I, I think um, global capital is absolutely welcome, but they need to engage. Um, at the moment, uh, at the moment, it's uh, you know they're, they're getting too easy a deal um, out there. Um, back in the infrastructures, you know, where they can come and go, it's it, it's too easy. I'm not an economist, so I can I can uh, uh, look at it from a from the same urban point of view. Um, it, it shouldn't be on to build uh, huge parks for 60,000 people and not think about housing um, because it burdens the infrastructure afterwards. Um, there have to be at the expense maybe of time, uh, time efficiency and so on and so forth, there has to be a more integrated approach. And I think leaving this sort of infrastructure together, avoiding to romanticize about um, uh, the, the kind of informality, uh, but also maybe less grand gestures, um, maybe planning that there is less formal, formally driven, more about managing, curating uh, these sort of disparate parts of the world. So now, apparently we're down to two minutes, so it's going to be really lightning. Uh, so uh, I think we've got Kate, Emmanuel, and Irene, and actually it's great that it's the three of you in terms of your closeout comments, we'll then close out here. Uh, because are you all talking different strategies? strategies? Speaking of fracture, do we need different approaches for the 7% informal, different ones for the <laughs> manufacturing and the middle class, and different ones for where we just trying to be responsive? So just your closing remarks. Shockingly, I actually agree with what Philip just said about the meso level. An integrated approach which connects what, with what our first speaker said about the government wanting to be at the center of everything. Governments have strategies for development, transport strategies, sanitation strategies, housing strategies, and it's important for investors and this kind of fora to engage with their strategies rather than disrupting them by pushing their own agenda. Engage with and enable government strategies to develop cities that they know within budgets that they know they have to work with um, in a balanced and integrated way because, partly because, the governments have an integrated view. I thought the other speakers comment about who are going to feed these cities. This is ju not just about cities, it's also about rural development. Um, the governments are the only publicly accountable system. The private sector is not publicly accountable. So governments need to be at the center of these things. Um, but one other, I think, core issue I think is, is there is that engaging with the informal economy is not romantic. They are the bulk of the population. They also create a number of jobs, and it's absolutely critical for uh, these kinds of fora and for governments to engage not just with investors and developers when they talk about cities, but to engage with taxi unions, vendors associations, community groups, enterprise associations, and respond to livelihood needs in the design of cities rather than elbowing them out and papering them over or concreting them over. Those people are still there, and many of them have highly capable systems that could be upgraded. So upgrade with uh, upgrading them, technical development, working with these systems to make them better taxi associations, better um, small enterprise uh, um, activities, more technically available, and work with the informal economy to formalize from within, rather than just shoving it aside because those jobless people are still there. I'm just going to add to what Philip uh, mentioned. I think we, we have a conversation in our practice uh, about thinking of buildings as incomplete census uh, that the users will complete, basically. And I think it might be productive to think of cities as maybe incomplete essays. So there's always a certain level of indeterminacy that should be embedded in the planning strategies. Because I think the tendency to overly determine these cities is the problem. Uh, because they're shifting so fast, the aspirations and the ambitions of the residents are shifting. So we need to find ways to inject them with certain levels of determinacy that are not too limited. Thank you. Okay. Um,
Um, a number of the comments actually remind me of these Lesotho factory workers that I spent time with um, and, and what their lives illustrate. And I think it picks up on Emmanuel's point of how do we categorize, how do we visualize, you know, how do we cut the data? Because their lives actually defy all these categories. So these women, they're all women, um, spend time, oh, they, they started their life in the informal context. And then because of Taiwanese and Chinese investment in the textiles and clothing sector in Lesotho, which is the largest sector in the country, uh, they became formalized. So they got incorporated in the formal economy. These are hard jobs. They were in China before they, they moved to Africa, and these are hard jobs. So they got involved in the trade union movement. And now they're challenging the leadership of the trade unions, which were a legacy from mining, right? All male dominated. And these are all you know, in, in textiles and in apparel manufacturing, the world over, 80% of the workers are women, and the Sutu is no exception. And so now they're knocking on the doors of the national leadership and challenging these men, right? And so it's just, I take so much inspiration from their story and their lives, because to me, it's a reminder of how, of a couple of things. One, of how people are multifaceted and they're interfacing with so many of these dimensions that we tend to talk about in isolation. But secondly, how there's a process of adaptation going on where, you know, one of the, the so China's industrialization is an amazing story, but worker protection was not one of the highlights of, of that. And in Lesotho, these women, because there's trade unions in Africa, or at least in Lesotho, in a way that there can't be in China, Right, they're adapting and interfacing with this foreign investment, hopefully in a way that will make the lives of themselves, their fellow workers, and huge swaths of, of their country much better. Uh, so we're really called to stop. Sorry, I have to cut in for one second. I think it's important to note that many of those Masuto factory workers lost their jobs overnight when the Taiwanese investors pulled up stakes because the trade preferences changed. It is not sustainable for Africa to be turned into a cheap labor pool for other people's agendas. They must develop their own systems and own uh, We really have to end. Vernon, do you have a last word? I'll say one thing. There was a question about the actual I was going to say, I, I'm really deeply suspicious of it, though, because of issues of confidence of the planners and issues of corruption. And enabling young entrepreneurs is a much better role for the government. So just on that really beautiful note of dissonance, <laughs> yeah, the senses, I should say, um, I just want to give Ricky an opportunity to make an announcement, or Philip, if there is, no? So lunch is happening now. And I hope that you all feel inspired that this is indeed a forum for debate and for disagreement and for discussion. And I guess what I walk away with from this session in particular is the importance of really clarifying what adaptive capacity means and that we can't figure that out unless we know the detail of what's happening on the ground in our cities. So thank you to our speakers who have been unbelievably disciplined. And, and great to you. So thank you. We'll reconvene after lunch, and uh, there will be a necessary balance to remind you to return. Thanks.